This morning we're going to be in 2 Samuel chapters 11 and 12. If you have a Bible, you're going to want to get over there because we'll be there. Uh, I also should mention that this passage does contain uh, a good deal of pretty mature uh, material. Uh, I'm not going to be graphic, but you might want to use your discretion if you have younger kids with you under about the age of 10. Uh, This is a passage that deals a lot with the topic of sin and very specifically with the topic of sexual sin. All of us over the last several years have become accustomed to hearing stories in the news or seeing stories in the news about celebrities and well-known people whose lives are damaged or even undone because of sexual sin. It's become so routine that often we barely notice it. Whether you are an ordinary person on Main Street or whether you are Bill Gates or Bill Cosby, I think we recognize that sin can lead to devastation, which can lead to destruction, not only in your own life, but in the lives of those around you. But I don't want to begin this morning really by talking about celebrities. Uh, I want to share for a moment a story that is a little bit closer to home for me. Uh, It's about a friend of mine, another pastor in another city. Three or four years ago, I happened to hear that he was stepping down from his pastoral position at the church where he had been for uh, about 15 years. He he had a, a growing church. In many ways, he was a mentor to me. He was a great teacher. He was a great writer. He had a family that loved him. And I wondered why he was stepping down, and and initially, I thought he was just tired. He was burnt out. He needed a break. And so he was moving into a new season of his life. But over the course of the next several months, as is sadly often the case, uh, more and more information began to come out about how he had betrayed his wife and his family with another woman in the church. And over the course of the next few months, ended up walking away from not only his pastoral position, but from his church, from his wife, alienated himself from his children, and even walked away from the Lord. And in the wake of that situation, as I, as I processed it, I kept thinking, what is it that would cause a person to seemingly so quickly burn down the life he had built? What was it that would cause somebody to, in a matter of months, torch the things that were most important in his life? And of course, over time, I came to understand it didn't happen in a matter of moments or in a matter of weeks or even in a matter of months. Instead, it was a moment-by-moment day-by-day, step-by-step process of allowing a little bit of sin into his heart, a little bit of discontent, a little bit of entitlement, a little bit of pride, a little bit of lust. He allowed it into his heart and his life and cultivated it and hid it until it sank its claws deeply into his heart and it grew to a point that he could no longer hide it. I think often we feel with sin that we can play with just a little bit of it, like like playing with fire, and then we find that it can torch our lives. It reminds me of a friend of mine in college who used to like to occasionally just put a little bit of lighter fluid on the hairs on his arm and light it up and watch it burn for a moment and then burn away, thinking I'm never going to get burned until he did. And fortunately, in his case, not severely. But he learned you can't light yourself on fire just a little bit. It's going to come back to bite you. Sin is the same way. You can't take just a little bit of it into your life and expect it not to damage your relationship with God, your relationships with other people. The temptation towards sin is everywhere. That's nothing new in our world or in our culture. The world has always been filled with sin ever since the day that Adam and Eve sinned against God. There's always been temptation. 
And all too often we believe that we can just play with it a little bit. But what the scripture tells us over and over and over again is you can't. Not without consequence. And so we, therefore, have to be constantly vigilant against sin and its destruction. Constantly vigilant in our minds, in our hearts, in our bodies. This morning, we're going to look at an episode in the life of King David as we continue our discussion of David. We're going to look at the darkest and saddest episode in his life. An episode in which he allowed a little bit of sin to enter into his life that grew and grew and grew until it resulted in consequences for his life that lasted the rest of his life. Not just consequences for his life, but consequences for the lives of others that would last well after his death and to the generations that followed him. And as we look at this episode in David's life, we are going to see how sin creates destruction. I want to offer a few principles about what sin does this morning that we need to understand if we're going to remain vigilant against it. It's a difficult passage, but I also am going to offer some hope. What is the hope in the midst of sin? If you find that you're in a place where you feel caught, what is the hope? I'm going to guess that there are some in the room this morning, uh, you're already playing with fire. Just a little bit, just a little bit of sin here and there that you're cultivating, that you're hiding. An image online here, a flirtation at the office over here, just a little bit of dishonesty, just, just to get ahead a little bit over here. Some discontent, some entitlement, some envy, and you're playing with fire. What we're going to see is where that pathway leads. And then we're going to see how to get out and how to get off the pathway of destruction. Follow with me, 2 Samuel chapter 11. I'm going to start in verse 1. Then it happened in the spring. At the time when kings go out to battle, that David sent Joab and his servants with him and all Israel, and they destroyed the sons of Ammon and besieged Rabbah. But David stayed at Jerusalem. Now, when evening came, David arose from his bed and walked around on the roof of the king's house. And from the roof, he saw a woman bathing, and the woman was very beautiful in appearance. The first principle about sin and temptation I want us to understand this morning is that success often leads to temptation. That it's not always at the moment when you're in the midst of trials that you're the most susceptible to, to sin. Sometimes it's in the moment of success. Remember last week how we talked about how to honor God while you are in a desert period, while you're waiting for certain things to come about in your life a period of suffering, a period of dryness. Often we think that's the time in our lives when we're most likely to get angry or bitter or sinful. But here in David's life, we see that success poses its own risk to temptation. I want to show you for just a minute what has happened in David's life since we left off last week. Just a few things have happened in his life. First of all, 2 Samuel 5, he is crowned king not only of the tribes of Judah, not only of the southern kingdom, but also of the northern kingdom. All Israel and Judah is now under David's reign. He finally has what God has promised him. He finally has the kingdom. Saul is gone. He's returned to the Ark of the Covenant to Jerusalem. Remember, the Ark of the Covenant was stolen by the Philistines at one point. It comes back into the nation of Israel, and then David goes and gets it. And with triumph, he brings it back to Jerusalem, and he sets it in the tabernacle so the people can worship God. He wants to build the temple. But God says, your son is going to do that. But David, I'm going to give you a covenant. This is 2 Samuel 7. God gives David an eternal covenant. He says, David, the, the throne will never depart from your family. 
generation after generation after generation of your kids, grandkids, great-grandkids, great-great-grandkids will reign on the throne of Israel all the way to Jesus and ultimately all the way to forever. That's a really great promise. And then David wins a string of military victories in chapters 8 through 10. So here he is. He's on top of the world. Everything is going Right. This is that moment in your life where you finally get what you waited for for so long. The business is thriving. The family is stable. There are no major crises. It is at that moment that temptation has a way of sneaking in. And the reason is because it's at that moment that we're tempted to become complacent. We often understand somewhat intuitively in the world outside the church that complacency and success can lead to one's downfall. So some of you will remember Kodak. At one time, Kodak was the the number one camera company in the world. They were on top. And over a period of about five years, they lost almost all of their market share and declared bankruptcy. Why? Because when they were on top, They could not see the threat of the digital revolution. And that led to their downfall. Their success led to complacency, which led to their downfall. Some of you will remember in 1980 how the United States Olympic hockey team miraculously defeated the Soviet hockey team. There's a movie about it called Miracle. Great movie. Some of you may have watched it on TV. But one of the things that led to that moment where the underdog United States team defeated this formidable Soviet team was that just a month or two before that, they had played an exhibition match in which the Soviets absolutely crushed the American team, 10 to 3, which for a hockey game is really bad. I don't watch hockey, but I understand that's really bad. And they got complacent in their success, and they couldn't see the threat. It's true in the spiritual life as well. This is what leads King David, a man after God's own heart, whom God is blessing with win after win after win. This is what leads this man to find himself walking around on top of his roof looking for trouble. Samuel is careful to tell us this is in the the return of the year, the, the spring, when kings go out to battle. He says that deliberately. The kings ought to be out on the battlefield. But David, instead of going, has sent Joab and all Israel to go and do what he ought to be joining them in doing, which is fighting God's battles. And you get the impression now of a king who's kind of grown lazy and complacent. So it says in the evening or the late afternoon, he gets up from his bed, right? This is your kids the first day of the summer. He's sleeping in. He gets up from his bed. It's a little hot. They didn't have air conditioning. So he goes out onto the roof. It's a little cooler on the roof. And I imagine David now he's just strolling around on the roof of his palace, surveying his kingdom. Look at all that I have built. Look at this city. Look at this palace. And my soldiers are out at war. And as he's strolling around on the roof, it says he looks down and he sees a woman bathing. Now, some people have asked, why was Bathsheba bathing outside in view of the palace where she could be seen? It's really important to understand at this moment that there was no indoor plumbing in the ancient Near Eastern world. She didn't have a shower in her master bathroom suite. So what people would often do is they would go outside into a fenced-in courtyard that was next to their home, and they would bathe outside in that courtyard. They would have a, a pot or a jar filled with water, and they would use that to bathe. From ground level, this was a private activity. Anybody walking by would not have been able to see her. She most likely doesn't expect that the king at that very moment is going to be walking around on his roof. We don't know what's in her mind. I share all of that to say this. The narrator here in our story makes sure to put all of the responsibility on David, not on Bathsheba. We don't know what's in her mind. What we do know is David is walking around and he sees her. 
And literally, Samuel says, she was very beautiful in appearance, or in the Hebrew, she was good to look at. Very is the way it says it. She is attractive, and immediately David is attracted to her, and he sees her, and he wants her. And what's happened in his heart and his mind is in his success, he's now put himself right in the path of an oncoming train of temptation. And he doesn't even see it yet. His success leads to temptation. If you are in a place in your life where you're saying, I have everything I need. Everything is good. That's the moment when temptation is likely to strike. Because that's the moment you're likely to stop depending on God. And to begin to believe I've earned everything I have. And that entitlement and maybe a little bit of that desire for more begins to creep in. And that's what happens to David. His success leads to temptation. What we're going to see then is one sin will now lead to another. I'm going to read a relatively long section of this passage and talk about it for a few minutes. But before I, before I do, here's what I want you to notice. I want you to pay attention as I read to how many times the word sent or send or sending are used in this passage. How many times David sends people here or there or sends for people or sends for this or that? This is important. This is a key word in the passage, and here's why. Because I think where David's sin begins is David in his success and in his pride and in his arrogance stops seeing people as human beings to be cared for, which was his job as the king. And he starts seeing them as tools to be sent here or there to fulfill his desires. His attitude has shifted. And that's going to lead from a sin of the heart To all kinds of sinful destruction. Follow with me. Chapter 11 verse 3. So David sent. And inquired about the woman. And one said. Is this not Bathsheba. The daughter of Eliam. The wife of Uriah the Hittite. Okay, This is an ancient servant's way. Of warning the king. Without getting his head lopped off. He knows what's in David's mind. Because he's seen her too. And so David sends, and the servant comes back and he goes, uh, This is, her name is Bathsheba. She is the daughter of one of your loyal soldiers, and she is the wife of one of your other soldiers, Uriah, who was one of the 30, one of the 30 best soldiers in David's army. He's telling David without saying it, Watch out. This is a bad idea. But David presses ahead. David sent messengers and took her. And when she came to him, he lay with her. And when she had purified herself from her uncleanness, she returned to her house. One quick comment on the last half of that verse. Some of your translations may say she was in the process of purifying herself from her uncleanness. I think that's probably more accurate. What the narrator is telling us, what Samuel is telling us, is that this woman is in the process of her monthly purification, which tells us she is at a stage in the month where she is most likely to get pregnant. This also tells us that this is not Uriah's baby, but it's David's baby. Now she goes back to her house, and sure enough, very next verse, the woman conceived, and she sent And told David and said, I am pregnant. So David, through his sins of the heart, his lust of the eyes, has gotten himself into a really bad situation. There's some parallels, by the way, in this passage between 2 Samuel 11 and what we see in Genesis chapter 3. He sees, he desires, he takes, and it leads to destruction. But the penalty in the Old Testament law for adultery is death. So David's in a really bad situation, and now he's got to find a way out. He's got to find a solution. So here's what he does. 
Then David sent, there it is again, he sent to Joab saying, send me Uriah the Hittite. So Joab sent Uriah to David. When Uriah came to him, David asked concerning the welfare of Joab and the people and the state of the war. So I want you to envision this. Uriah is out there fighting for the nation of Israel. David sins to get him and Uriah shows up and David goes, hey, how things going? Now, remember, Uriah is a general, basically. He's one of the 30 best soldiers. I'm sure at this point, Uriah is going, why am I here? Could you not have asked any of the other dozens of messenger boys how it's going? There are people for that. But David has something else in mind. Because he needs Uriah to go and be with his wife to provide a cover. And so he says, David said to Uriah, verse 8, go down to your house. And wash your feet, which is probably a euphemism here, for spend some quality time with your wife. And Uriah went out of the king's house, and a present from the king was sent out after him. He's very generous in this moment. But look at this. But Uriah slept at the door of the king's house with all the servants of his lord and did not go down to his house. Now when they told David, saying, Uriah did not go down to his house... David said to Uriah, have you not come from a journey? Why did you not go down to your house? David is now goading him just a little bit. Hey, Uriah, you just came from a long journey. I invited you here. Why would you not go down to your house and spend some time with your wife, who is very good to look at, very good to look at? Why don't you go and rest and eat? Now watch Uriah's response. Uriah said to David, the ark and Israel and Judah are staying in temporary shelters. And my Lord Joab and the servants of my Lord are camping in the open field. Shall I then go to my house to eat and to drink and to lie with my wife? By your life and the life of your soul, I will not do this thing. David has vastly underestimated Uriah's integrity in this moment. Uriah wants to go back to the battlefield. To sleep with his wife at this moment would have rendered him temporarily unclean or unfit to go back out to the battlefield. Not only that, but he goes, look, the Ark of the Covenant where God's presence resides is in the open field. It's not at home. Not only that, but Joab and all the guys I'm fighting with, they also would love to come home and eat and drink and be with their wives. How could I do such a thing? It would be wrong on every level. David underestimates Uriah's integrity, and the reason is because at this moment, his own mind is filled with darkness and filth. And when our own minds are filled with sin, we can't imagine how somebody else could be pure. And so David now resorts to tactic two, the age-old tactic, get him drunk. So in verse 12, David said to Uriah, stay here today also, and tomorrow I will let you go. So Uriah remained in Jerusalem that day and the next. Now David called him, and he ate and drank before him, and he made him drunk. And in the evening, he went out to lie on his bed with the Lord's servants, but he did not go down to his house. He still won't go down to his house. Uriah drunk is more righteous than David sober. And so David finally hatches another plan. Now in the morning, David wrote a letter to Joab, and he sent it by the hand of Uriah. He had written in the letter saying, place Uriah in the front line of the fiercest battle and withdraw from him so that he may be struck down and die. So it was as Joab kept watch on the city that he put Uriah at the place where he knew there were valiant men. The men of the city went out and fought against Joab and some of the people among David's servants fell and Uriah the Hittite also died. Then Joab sent and reported to David all the events of the war. He charged the messenger saying, when you have finished telling all the events of the war to the king, and if it happens that the king's wrath rises and he says to you, why did you go so near to the city to fight? Did you not know that they would shoot from the wall? Who struck down Abimelech, the son of Jerubasheth? Did not a woman throw an upper millstone on him from the wall so that he died at Thebes? This is a reference to an event in the book of Judges, by the way. This is how Gideon's son Abimelech died. He got too close to the wall. A woman dropped a big stone on his head. Why did you go so near the wall? Then you shall say, your servant Uriah the Hittite is dead also. So the messenger departed and came and reported to David all that Joab had sent him to tell. 
The messenger said to David, the men prevailed against us and came out against us in the field, but we pressed them as far as the entrance of the gate. Moreover, the archers shot at your servants from the wall. So some of the king's servants are dead and your servant Uriah the Hittite is also dead. Then David said to the messenger, thus you shall say to Joab, to Joab, do not let this thing displease you for the sword devours one as well as another. Make your battle against the city stronger and overthrow it. And so encourage him. David plays the magnanimous forgiving king. It's important also to understand in the midst of a siege, there's no reason to attack the wall because that's the whole point of a siege. You circle around the city and you just wait them out. Eventually they run out of food. They run out of water and they will surrender or they will die. You don't have to grab your guys and charge the wall. But David in his blindness and his sin, he puts a letter in Uriah's hand that will end up getting Uriah dead. And he says, I want you to charge the wall anyway, knowing that from the wall, there would be archers who would shoot down on the men next to the wall and kill them. David understands war. He understands battle. And when he's at his best, he wins victories for Israel. When he's at his worst, he uses it for dark, dark means. And so he gets not only Uriah killed, but other men as well. See what's happened as one sin leads to another sin, to another sin. It begins with this lust in his eyes. It begins with this darkness in his heart, this entitlement, this arrogance, this pride. And it leads to sexual immorality, adultery, to a cover up and then to murder. It all turns into a snowball that rolls downhill faster then he can stop it. That's what sin does. It has a way of spiraling out of control. And we think I got this until it sinks its claws into us and it won't let us go. And it produces devastating consequences in our lives. All too often, if we're engaged in sin, our immediate instinct is to cover it up just like David did. I need to hide. I need to try to make sure that nobody knows that nobody sees and whatever I've got to do to cover it up, I'll do it. And the cover up just makes things worse. It reminded me this week. Some of you will remember the 1986 Chernobyl nuclear power plant disaster in Soviet Russia. If you don't remember it, in essence, what happened is there was an explosion at a big nuclear power plant in the Ukraine, actually in the, in the former Soviet Union. And it happened because they were lax with their safety procedures. They were not doing what they should have been doing to make sure that it was safe. But then there's ex this explosion. Some people die. And immediately the Soviets try to cover it up. They evacuate the town. They don't tell anybody. But what happened is the explosion released a radioactive cloud up into the air. And that radioactive cloud began to drift west. And it was right about when it was over the country of Sweden that the Swedes looked up and they thought, that doesn't look right. And so they get on the phone and they call the Soviets and they go, is that yours? And the Soviets go, mm, no, no, maybe, I don't know, call China, right? Call someone else. And they deny and they deny until they can't deny anymore. And it becomes so obvious that they were the source of this cloud now drifting across the world that threatened to harm people. And in fact, many say that the cover up of that moment forced them into changes that eventually led to the downfall of the Soviet Union itself. The cover up was worse than the crime. And that's the case with David. And that's the case with us. One sin leads to another sin. To another sin. And what happens is we, we experience this guilt and shame, this distance in our relationship with God, and that then affects our relationships with other people. And because we're already ashamed and distant from God, we begin to withdraw more, and that creates additional consequences and additional sins. And then we begin to withdraw more, and all of a sudden there is a radioactive cloud of sin hovering over our lives, infecting everything around us. And it snowballs into something devastating. That's what sin does. One sin leads to another. And ultimately, we'll see this in David's life. 
Sin leads to destruction. It leads to devastation. Verses 26 and 27. Now, when the wife of Uriah heard that Uriah, her husband, was dead, she mourned for her husband. When the time of mourning was over, David sent, there it is again, and brought her to his house, and she became his wife. Then she bore him a son, but the thing that David had done was evil in the sight of the Lord. Let's look at the consequences now. Uriah's dead. Other men are dead. We're going to see that David's son is going to die. And what we'll see down the line is that there are consequences because of this sin that ripple on for generations. One of David's sons, Absalom, would initiate a coup against David, a rebellion, and he'll take away David's wives and concubines because the prophet Nathan is going to tell David, just as you took away somebody else's wife, somebody's going to take yours. Just as you use violence, To solve your problems and cover up your sin. He says the sword will never depart from your house. And that becomes true of David. His children and his grandchildren fight against one another for generation after generation after generation. After he dies, his kids begin to fight about the kingdom itself and they kill one another. One of his sons, Amnon, sexually assaults his daughter, Tamar. And all of this comes about because David had sown violence and adultery and immorality. The consequences ripple on. The sin leads to destruction. And I point this out because I think we're tempted to read this passage. And we say, wow, David sinned, but he was a man after God's own heart. And then he said I was, he was sorry and everything was good. Everything was not good. Because this is what sin does. Even though there's restoration and forgiveness, and we'll see this in a moment, God forgives him. And actually, the most devastating consequences of David's sin don't happen. But not all the consequences go away. There are lasting consequences. He can't get rid of those. My friend that I talked about at the beginning of this message, there are lasting consequences in his life. I pray for him to return to the Lord, to confess his sin and seek forgiveness. And I'm confident that God will forgive him if he does. But the relationship he has with his daughters will never be the same. The church he left in shambles will never be the same. The opportunity he had in this season to proclaim and reflect the reputation and the glory of Jesus for this season, it's gone. There is forgiveness, but real consequences come from sin. If you and I were driving down the road this week and I happen to be driving behind you and I start looking at my phone and in my distraction, I don't notice that we're at a stoplight. And so I run right into the back of your car. We would get out and we'd exchange insurance information and I might get out and I would say, I'm so sorry. This is my fault. Will you forgive me? And because you're a gracious person, I believe you'll say, yes, I forgive you. And then I will say, okay, we're good. I'll see you later on. And you go, no, wait, 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 wait. Somebody still has to pay for my car, which has a huge dent. I go, yeah, but you forgave me, right? We're good. You go, well, but there's still damage. There's still consequences. Maybe the police roll up and they realize I caused it. And so they start writing me a ticket. And I say, no, officer, you don't understand. He forgave me. I don't get a ticket. God forgives me. He forgave me. You should forgive me. The officer says, well, that's great. And and I, you know, that's great. You're forgiven. But the city of College Station is a little bit more strict about their policies. Because the consequences still remain, even though there's forgiveness. This is what happens in David's life. Once we begin down that pathway, one sin leads to another sin, to another sin. And that that radioactive cloud begins to grow. Every time we add to it, we are running the risk that there will be consequences that could last the rest of our lives, at least on this side of heaven. So it's nothing to trifle with. 
We cannot play with fire and not get burned. Here's the good news, though, as we move toward the end of our story this morning. Sin does lead to destruction, but confession leads to forgiveness. I want to read briefly chapter 12, verses 1 through 15. Then the Lord sent Nathan to David. Up to this point, David's been doing the sending. Now it's God's turn to send. The Lord sent Nathan to David, and he came to him and said, There were two men in one city, the one rich and the other poor. The rich man had a great many flocks and herds, but the poor man had nothing except one little ewe lamb, which he bought and nourished, and it grew up together with him and his children. It would eat of his bread and drink of his cup and lie in his bosom and was like a daughter to him. Now a traveler came to the rich man, and he was unwilling to take from his own flock or his own herd to prepare for the wayfarer who had come to him. Rather, he took the poor man's ewe lamb and prepared it for the man who had come to him. Then David's anger burned greatly against the man, and he said to Nathan, As the Lord lives, surely the man who has done this deserves to die. He must make restitution for the lamb fourfold, because he, had, he did this thing and had no compassion. David's sense of justice is still intact. Nathan then said to David, You are the man. Thus says the Lord God of Israel, it is I who anointed you king over Israel, and it is I who delivered you from the hand of Saul. I also gave you your master's house and your master's wives into your care, and I gave you the house of Israel and Judah, and if that had been too little, I would have added to you many more things like these. In other words, David, when you were strolling around on the roof of your palace, glorying in your success, did you ever pause to think who gave it to you? Did you ever pause to think, David, that you were in as much need of God at that moment as you were when you were running from Saul in the wilderness? You didn't. And that's where the entitlement came from. That's where the pride came from. That's where the lust came from and the murder that filled your heart. Why have you despised the word of the Lord by doing evil in his sight? You have struck down Uriah the Hittite with the sword, have taken his wife to be your wife, and have killed him with the sword of the sons of Ammon. Now, therefore, the sword shall never depart from your house, because you have despised me and have taken the wife of Uriah the Hittite to be your wife. Thus says the Lord, behold, I will raise up evil against you from your own household. I will even take your wives before your eyes and give them to your companion, and he will lie with your wives in broad daylight. Indeed, you did it secretly, but I will do this thing before all Israel and under the sun. Then David said to Nathan, I've sinned against the Lord. And Nathan said to David, the Lord also has taken away your sin. You shall not die. However, because by this deed you have given occasion to the enemies of the Lord to blaspheme, the child also that is born to you shall surely die. So Nathan went to his house. So our story ends on a bit of a dark note, but I want to, I want to mention this because it's important. Notice what David does when he finally is confronted with his sin. He issues one confession. I have sinned against the Lord full stop. Not I have sinned against the Lord, but, but, but God, why did you make her so pretty? Not I have sinned against the Lord, but, but look, I'm 45 going to battle is harder than it used to be. Not I have sinned against the Lord, but, but, but I had all these reasons. I've sinned against the Lord. Full stop. And this is important. Notice the contrast here between David and Saul. When Saul sinned against the Lord and offered sacrifice in place of the priests when he should not, Saul had all the excuses and God took away the kingdom. David has none of the excuses and all of the contrition. And as a result, Nathan says, God is not going to take your life and his descendants will still inherit the throne. See, that's the key. Saul's descendants lost the throne because of Saul's disobedience. The covenant God makes to David still stands and generation after generation of David's descendants still get to sit on the throne all the way up to Jesus. So although there are severe consequences for David's sin, 
There's forgiveness and restoration. God is ready to forgive. God is ready to restore your relationship with him and your relationships with others, although there will be consequences. First John 1, 9 and 10, a famous passage in the New Testament. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and righteous to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we say that we have not sinned, we make him a liar and his word is not in us. Our temptation in those moments is to say, I didn't do it. It wasn't me. Or I had a reason. David says, I've sinned. Full stop. Let me be clear this morning. If you know Jesus Christ, if you've trusted in Jesus Christ and his death and resurrection to forgive all of your sin and give you eternal life, there is no sin that is going to separate you eternally from God. You can know that you have eternal forgiveness of all of your sins. You're going to heaven. But in the meanwhile, there are still very real consequences for our sins. Our relationship with God can be, can be damaged. There can be distance. And our relationships with other people, it can ripple into our churches, our communities, and our world. And so day by day, what we're called to do is we come before the Lord and we confess and we seek forgiveness. We confess and we seek restoration. This is no different from if you're a parent and one of your kids disobeys. You don't remove them from the family. But instead they come and they seek forgiveness. Or maybe you ask them for forgiveness for hurting them. And the closeness of that relationship is restored. Even if some consequences remain. And so the hope is we serve a gracious and holy and kind and merciful God. Always ready to forgive. So again, if you're in a situation where you're, you're playing with fire, and you know it this morning, you know you're playing with fire. The message of our passage, there's still hope. There is time to confess and receive God's forgiveness and to plot a new pathway for the rest of your life. Even if you feel this morning that you have made a train wreck of everything. There's still hope for the future. Because we have a gracious God. A few practical ways then that we can be vigilant against sin and resist it. First of all, pray for protection. Every morning when you get up, every night when you go to sleep, and dozens of times in between, pray what Jesus taught us to pray in Matthew chapter 6. Lead me not into temptation, but deliver me from evil. Lead me not into temptation, but deliver me, God, from evil. Protect me from temptation. Secondly, always remain vigilant. It may be that you are struggling with looking at uh, sexualized images on the internet. And in order to remain vigilant, you may have to get rid of one or more of your social media accounts or give access to your phone to a trusted friend or your spouse or not have internet access at your home for a while. It may not be sexualized images. It may be that, that looking at uh, social media just sparks envy and discontent and entitlement and pride in your heart. And so you have to remain vigilant on your guard at all times because sin is sneaky and destructive. Thirdly, find a trusted friend who will pray for you and to whom you can confess your sin. Somebody who knows you well, that you trust. I have a few friends in my life that I can call or talk to who will pray for me and encourage me. Before something turns into a giant radioactive cloud, catch it while it's small. So confess quickly and seek forgiveness day after day, moment by moment. Remain ever vigilant. But also trust we have a God of mercy and grace who can bring restoration and healing even in the darkest moments of sin. Because ultimately what he desires is for each of us to live a life that is glorifying and pleasing to him. 
And so he's ready to turn our path and help us to do that. But you can't play with fire. If you're playing with fire and you know you need help, we also have some resources here we can help you with. You can talk with me, Chris Thompson, Dusty Davis. If you're playing with fire, today is the day to stop and ask God to help you plot a new path for the sake of his glory in light of his grace. Would you pray with me? Father, we thank you so much for your word. We thank you for all that it teaches us about your kindness and your goodness and also about your holiness. We pray you would lead us not into temptation this week, but deliver us from evil. Whatever it takes, Father, allow us to follow you. Give us your spirit's power to do what we cannot do on our own. Father, we pray let us be a community and let us be a people who are faithful to you, who seek holiness and are willing to confess quickly and receive your forgiveness. We pray all of this in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you. Have a wonderful week.